Hi, I'm Kurt Bonk from Indiana University. I've been asked to talk about best practices, activities, examples of what people can do in online or even blended learning environments. Now, I think there are a couple things. First of all, everyone should think about low risk, low cost, low time activities. There's a continuum from low to high risk, low to high cost, low to high time. And if you're new to online learning, start with baby steps. I mean, if you've seen you know, the movie What About Bob with Bill Murray, you see he's taking baby steps. And all of us can do that and try one or two new things out in your courses every semester, potentially. There's so much that's possible today that we all get overwhelmed by it. I mean, I'm trying to make sense of it myself. And when I get a news report from the Chronicle of Higher Education or Educause or some other place, Sometimes I want to ignore it and hit the delete button myself. But what I've been trying to do over the past decade is create frameworks for people. So let me walk you through in a fairly rapid way two frameworks that might get you to reflect on how in fact you could utilize technology. So let me give you the one that came out in a, in a book last summer called Empowering Online Learning with Josie Bass. A method called Read, Reflect, Display, and Do also known as R2-D2, or my Star Wars model. So what can you do with students to read online? There's so much text available today on the web. If you're teaching language classes or other things, you can have people accessing free journals. And um, read those, write on those, comment on those. You can have them read each other's blog posts. If they're doing an online diary or a blog, they could be doing critical friend activities, giving feedback to each other on that work. They could be reading all the work of Charles Darwin or William Shakespeare, all available online. So finding portals of work from that is existing or having your students write that work. Uh, but then moving from all that text. Um, in fact, I have something I call Library Day, where every student finds a set of articles on the internet and write summaries or reflections on them. So first they find and read, the read, then reflect. They write a summary blog post, short ones, of what they found on the internet. Or they might reflect on a video that they saw in CNN or in YouTube that you assign them. So the students, I find, really appreciate the short little snippets online, like two, three minute YouTube videos that can make that PowerPoint lecture uh, plus the textbook you're reading and class activities all come together with that short visual that shows them if you're teaching psychology a psychologist doing the research or, or something else. So read, then reflect on what you've seen or read about, then display. Having your students use a tool like MindMeister or Gliffy or these concept mapping tools that are free on a web to do a concept map or a timeline or to watch an animation clip that might be available in YouTube or TeacherTube. Now there's TeacherTube for online contents. But to use these, these rich uh, visual resources that are available today, because the bandwidth today uh, is more um, stable, I guess. There's more people with broadband. There's, more, um, there's cheaper storage costs. So there's more use of video. And so having reading activities, then reflective writing activities, uh, whether it's a blog post or something, or even just a podcast, listening to uh, an audio file, and then going to displaying what you're learning, either watching something visual or creating something visual like a timeline or a concept map of some sort, and then moving to doing activities like a simulation kind of activity or a wiki, which is a collaborative tool, take the wiki wiki here in Hawaii, uh, but a collaborative document, right, is a, a wiki tool or, and having your students contribute to it, like make suggestions on your syllabus or create a glossary for your class in a wiki activity. My students do wiki books. We're writing books on the web. So doing something like solving a problem, doing a problem-based learning, doing a simulation activity. So reading, reflecting, displaying, and doing. That's one framework again in my Empowering Online Learning book. The next book I'm working on is about motivation and retention online with a model I call Tech Variety where every letter stands for a motivational principle because face it, one of the biggest issues we have, especially with young men I find, is motivation and retention. And so we start with the T of Tech Variety which stands for tone. 
setting a tone where students feel comfortable. I have an eight nouns activity where students tell me eight nouns that describe themselves. I'm a pirate, I'm a music lover, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm like the wind or, or whatever. And by the time they list six or seven nouns, the seventh or eighth become hard and they start revealing stuff about themselves that even they don't know. And students build this socially, you know, shared knowledge base or having them post their favorite websites, or having them post the commitments they're going to make to the class, or having them post their goals to the class, and you can then respond to them and point out you might get to that in week eight, or week six, or week 15. So these social icebreakers on the front is the tone. Th second is E. You want to get at encouragement, you see, the E word. Very important, feedback to students. Very important online. Students want feedback in everything you do, and you can't provide it, so I have critical friends who give feedback to each other. I have students who take online practice exams. The computer might score a grade and give feedback, so it's not just me doing that feedback, but it's very important to build in encouragement and feedback through some kind of a um, system where every week they might self-test. There's a professor who teaches the muscular system at Penn State who had hundreds of thousands of people around the world using this self-testing site he created on the muscular system last December. He had 200 students, hundreds of thousands of people used his website. Okay. Then the third is curiosity. A curiosity could be an online field trip, could be uh, some kind of online uh, activity, uh, going to a remote site, having some global correspondence, but uh, we see a lot of virtual field trips, going to see J.R. Tolkien's homes in Oxford, for instance, before reading Lord of the Rings, you know. Um, going on a virtual field trip to Gettysburg before an activity related to that. So, yeah, curiosity, we have uh, ice story projects where Arctic explorers and Antarctic explorers work uh, in scientific projects and post them to the web. So all these get at curiosity. You know, there's a lot of adventure learning at, the, at uh, Mount Everest, the bloggers post at explorersweb.com. And then we get, so it's T-E-C, then we get a uh, uh, tech variety. The V stands for variety, just changing things up. Don't always use a lot of reading activities. Think about writing activities, think about reflection, think about visual, think about hands-on. So the variety component becomes important. How can you change things up a little bit in a logical, planful, integrative way?